Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. We're grateful for your time. And we're really excited to start the year on a great note. So thank you everybody. So without taking much of our time, today we're looking at our functions and tidy evaluations. So the agenda for today, we're going to, okay, we welcome all of you. We're appreciative of your presence every time we have our webinar. We're grateful. Thank you so much. So we're also going to introduce the organizers, the speaker, then we'll give the platform to our speaker today to go ahead with his presentation. Then we'll take questions and answers. So if you have, if you have any question along the way, Please put them in the chat box or notify us to me so that we'll know you have a question or you want to contribute to the program today. Then we'll have the final thing as a vote of thanks. So today we're looking at um, our functions and tidy evaluation. And um, our speaker today, Stephen, is a certified art studio instructor, Tidyverse and Shiny. Okay, he works with the developmental sector in Nigeria, where he continuously uses data to improve healthcare services and um, also project performance. And he has in his portfolio two R packages, tidy NDR and check NDR to support his um, work so far. So Stephen is a member of the African R community and he's also one of our co-organizers here in the Abuja R user group. So kindly help me to welcome Stephen. So Stephen, are you ready? Let's give me a few seconds. Try to bring my slide up now. Okay, okay, let me stop sharing. Thank you so much. So can you try it now? Okay, can you confirm that you can see my screen, please? All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, good evening, good morning, wherever you're joining us from today. Uh, I'm Bradley Gostivin, and I'll be taking us through our functions and tidy evaluation. Um, it's having some network challenges this evening. So I'm really hoping that this network is really going to hold. But if there are issues, um, I'll try and resolve them as soon as possible. So kindly bear with me. So thanks once again, um, Billy Kisi for the introduction. She has already mentioned that I'm a public health expert and that I'm also a data scientist. Um, I'm part of the co-organizers of the Abuja Radio Group. Um, you can also follow me on any of the uh, social media, the LinkedIn, the Twitter, the GitHub, and also my website where I post a few things. Uh, so we're going to be using this outline for today's presentation. We're going to look at definition of our functions. What are the components of the function? And why do you want to write one? What are the types of or common types of R functions that you can have. And then we'll zoom in on a particular type of uh, R functions, which are data, uh, data frame functions. And we're going to get a lot of time to uh, practice. And like she rightly mentioned, we're also going to have questions and answers. Uh, just a bit of assumption for this session today. Uh, I'm assuming that the participants on this call have a basic understanding of R, understands what um, the data structure in R looks like, um, the 
atomic vectors, what a data frame is, and also what a function is. But should we have participants on this call who probably don't understand most of these things? I'll make sure, I'll try as much as possible to ensure that even people who are completely going to R, are probably completely going to data science and analytics are still able to follow and have a sense of what we're talking about on today's session. So the definition, what's an R function? So an R function is just a block of reusable codes that helps you to perform a particular tasks. I imagine you want to do something repeatedly a few times or maybe several times, and uh, you don't want to start writing the entire lines of codes all the time. You can put it together in a form and it helps you to be able to exit. Practically everything that we do in R are functions. So we have the inbuilt functions that come with R and helps us to be able to execute our codes. But beyond just the inbuilt functions, R also gives you the opportunity to be able to write your own function with them. And they will do tasks in ways that are sometimes really exciting. So how does an R function look, look like? Basically, it has three, three components. There is a function name, so you give your function a name. Uh, your function may have one or zero more elements uh, that helps to determine how your functions behave. And your function has a third part, which is called the body of the function. The body of the function is that comes with the bigger package to understand this a bit better. So the function name is dplayer. That's the function. Player. Then the function has these arguments, a couple of them. So we just look at this. It's an argument that has two parts, the argument name and the value for the argument. So for instance, the dot by here as a value of now and the dot preserve as a value of false. And then this is the body of your uh, function that specifically called the task. So I want us to pay attention to the uh, argument name and the argument value because they're going to really come handy in a bit. Uh, we should understand when we say something is an argument name and then what the value of the, uh, what the value of the argument is. Right, so why would you want to write functions? Generally, we talked about just helping you to automate tasks. You, to, to speed up analytics process, you want to automate the things that can be automated. And if you're going to be doing the same thing a couple of times, writing a function really helps. The other thing functions does is that it helps also to minimize waste. So, uh, and duplications. You don't want to keep writing the same uh, chunk of code over and over and over again. Uh, that predisposes to us, and that also makes it difficult to maintain your code. So putting such repetitions in your function uh, is really the way to go. Functions also can have names like we talked about. A function's name, when descriptive enough, helps to really be able to come down on the exact task, like what exactly is this code of a uh, code chunk doing? And when you give it that descriptive name and that person is able to easily understand, okay, this is, I mean, focus on the results and not just the lines of code that you have. I already talked about eliminating mistakes that can help you to copy and paste. So what are the types of functions we will look at today? We will look at three categories or three common categories of functions in R. Are the functions with vector functions? And these vector functions deal with um, a particular atomic vector. Uh, maybe you have a group of numbers, let's say one, two, three, four, five, and you want to do a particular type of manipulation. So you write a vector function for that and it helps you to do that. I'm going to look at examples in a bit. And then we have the data frame functions. 
At the time, that's basically it's um, a group of packages and a group of functions that accepts data from and usually generally returns data frame. So most of the tidy verse functions are relatively data frame functions. And then we'll see how this can be applied when you want to write your own set of functions. How do you take of rectangular data and then write a function that manipulates that rectangular data and gives you the results that you want? And then the third type of functions um, are the plot functions. The plot generally takes a data and then creates a chart for you as an output. And we will really not be dwelling much on the plot functions today because um, the general principle guiding the data frame functions also follow the plot, except that instead of returning a data frame, they return a plot. Uh, for the sake of time and to ensure that we really don't over, over, overwhelm this session, we're going to just zoom in spe more specifically on the, the vector functions and data frame functions. So just a little bit more of background on data frame functions. I want to really establish some um, important things that are really going to help us when we get to the uh, practical component um, is the concept of variables. And, and in R, basically we, we say variables a lot, but um, to some extent, it's important to understand that there are generally two types of variables. You can have variables in your environment, and environment are those objects that you have saved in your um, R space. And uh, for, for instance, on the, uh, the plot we have, we, we can see the uh, MPG, which is um, a data frame uh, variable, and we can also see the X, Y uh, variables in our environment. And you can also have variables that are part of your data frame, so that more or less like the column names for, for your data frame. So you have the data frame variables, and we have the environment variables. Again, the environment variables are those objects that you have written into your environment, and your data frame variables are the column names, um, are, are the column names in, in your data sets. So talking about tidyverse functions and then tidy evaluation. Uh, basically, when you are referring to variables in most of these R functions, you are, have to be explicit about the variable you are referring to. Are you referring to the variable in the environment or the variable in the data set? Take for instance, if I, prior, if I write X and I assign it a value of two, that gets stored in my environment. And when I print X on my console, then I'll be referring to X that is in my environment. But if I have a data set that has a column named X, then for me to be able to refer to that column in my data set, I will have to write something like the name of my data set followed by a dollar sign and then my X. That way base R is very explicit as to, are you referring to the variable in the environment, or you're referring to the variable in your data set. This explicit um, component is not, I mean, it's, with tidyverse functions, is really not that explicit because tidyverse helps you to focus on writing readable functions. So you might end up having functions where it can get confusing sometimes. Are you referring to the variable in the environment, or are you referring to the variable in the data set? And that's usually is one of the major helps tidy so that they don't have to be referring to your data all the time. So if I have a data called cars for Uh, 
Can you hear me now? Can you confirm that you can hear me? You can see my screen. We can hear you, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, so I uh, was talking about tidy evaluation, helping you to minimize repetitions by using two uh, methods. One is called the data masking, and the second one is called the tidy selection. We're going to look at them uh, when we get to the practical session. Uh, the data masking is used by functions that work on rows. An example of such functions, you have the filter, you have the group by, you have the arrange. And tidy selection uh, is used by functions that work on column. For instance, when you are using the select function or you are using the rename functions. So basically, these are the things that helps R to minimize the repetitions in, are you referring to the variable in the environment or you are referring to the uh, variable in the data set? Unfortunately, when you are writing functions with tidyverse, you might have to be more explicit such that your functions know where to point to. Is it the environment or the data set? And that concept is called indirection. And we're going to see it in action in a bit. All right. So to the practice sessions, I've created about five scenarios. So we're going to try and walk through the five scenarios. Um, the first scenario I will have to do with, the first scenario we do with working with um, atomic function, I mean, vector functions. So imagine we have a data containing age of children. Uh, we've been told that these children are between zero to 15 years. Uh, but the data you have has some values that are less than zero and some values that are more than 15. So you want to record any values not within the zero to 15 as missing. Uh, so imagine a function to do something like that. And then you want to be able to expand this function such that it doesn't only work on age, but it also works on weight and maybe any of the other um, numeric variables that you might have in your data set. Uh, we're going to see how to expand that function to be able to do this. That's for, going to be for the first scenario. And for the second scenario, we're going to try and work on the diamond data sets that comes with uh, the tidyverse package. And in the diamond data set, we'll write about four functions that does specific things. Uh, we want to be able to summarize by our, our diamond data sets by specific variables. We're going to write such functions. But while writing the functions, we're going to see that there are a lot of repetitions. So we want to be able to make the function more generic in scenario three, such that one function will be able to do all the previous four and maybe more. Uh, depending on what we want to be able to use it to do. So that generic function becomes more helpful because we don't have to be repeating a lot of quotations. Okay. We'll see how to do that in scenario three. By the time we get to scenario four, uh, sometimes you might want to supply more than one values to your function so, so, such that you might not be able to tell from the start, is it going to take one or two or three uh, values as an, so we will, now expand our function, the same one we've been writing, such that it's able to accept multiple values at a time. And the last function, our, our scenario we're going to try and create is such that you're able to customize what the name of the variables in your outputs will be. Right, so these are the five functions and the scenarios we're going to walk through. And hopefully they will be able to help us see how uh, benefits of writing our functions and also how to use the um, tidy evaluation uh, to be able to um, write generic tidyverse functions, uh, generic functions that use the tidyverse um, functions. So I'm going to go ahead and share my R Studio environment now. Stop now. Stop there. Hey, service is serious. Can you help us mute your mic, please, if you are not asking questions or talking? Thank you. Okay. All right, I believe you can see my screen. Okay. Oh.
So we're go, going to go ahead now. Uh, again, we're going to be using a few packages, the tidyverse package, basically. Uh, and then we're going to be using the Pacman to load our packages. So this is me loading my packages into R. And the first scenario we're going to have is the function that helps us to be able to um, correct age like we talked about. So we're going to have a vector, let's say age, and we're going to write a function called clamp age. And what clamp age will do is that if any age is not within zero to 19, it's going to uh, rec record it as missing. Okay, so we have a function name and we have the function argument. It just takes your vector. So let's write the function body. So a function body is going to use the if x. So if x is less than zero or x is greater than 15, record as any, otherwise give us the value of x. That's basically what our clamp age will do. Take each of the age that we have supplied, check is it less than zero or greater than 15. If it is any of those, return it as missing. Missing in R is written as any, otherwise give us that value of X. So we're going to execute this. And we have, had, we have this set of age that have been supplied here, about 10 of them, I believe. And uh, may looking at it, we're already seeing one here, 22, another one here is 19, and we have a minus two. So just a quick look where we, we know that we're expecting that once we apply our function on this particular vector, we should have at least three of them, this 19, 22, and minus two recorded as missing because they are not within the zero to 15 that we have talked about. So let's see what our result gives us when we apply it. Okay, so my results here, like I see that it seems our function works well. I has changed the 19 to any, the same for the 22, and the same for the minus two. Right, so this function seems to work. So let's now apply it to this data frame called DF pediatrics that we have. I'm going to go ahead and print DF pediatrics so we see it looks like. A printing age, we see that we have three variables. We have sex, we have age, and then we have weight. And our DF pediatrics already has a, an age that is minus three, another one that is 22, and another one that is 17. So we again have three that are outside the uh, range that we expect them to be. So I'm calling the DF pediatrics and I'm creating a new variable called age clean that the clamp age is going to, um, using the clamp age function. So we're creating a new variable called age clean that is going to clean the age by using the clamp age functions. And once I run this, I can see the result here. The H is the second column and then the newly created variable called age clean is the third. And the minus three has been recorded to any, just like we expect. The minus uh, 22 has also been, the same thing has been done to minus 22 and the 17. So this really seems to work. Great. But the next thing we want to be able to do is we want to expand the clamp age such that it's it's not just for age, it works on uh, the age and also the weight. And maybe because we've been told that for children zero to 15, you wouldn't expect any of the age to be less than, I mean, you wouldn't expect any of the weight to be less than zero. And at the same time, none of the age probably should be more than 45. Let's assume we've been given that information. So we know that there is a minimum uh, weight and a maximum weight. Uh, we also know that there is a minimum age and then there is a maximum age. So we're writing a new function now called clamp number. So our clamp number is going to take again our vector and then it's going to have a minimum value and a maximum value, right? And what we now do is write uh, the body of our function to say, 
if else x less than mu or x is greater than max, record it as any, otherwise give us the value of x. Right. So if I apply the clamp number now, I may decide to give default value, uh, say for instance, because the, our initial interest was in, was applying it on H, so we're going to give it a minimum value of zero and also supply. <laughs> Miracle steaming. Yeah, can you can you help meet your mics? Thank you. <laughs> you know. Apologies for that, everyone. So we have a clamp number function that takes a minimum and a maximum. We're setting the we're setting defaults. So the minimum is zero, and then the ma maximum is fifteen because that works for H. And let's run this clamp number function now. Then we can apply the same thing to our pediatrics data set again, so that age clean we apply clamp number H, taking the uh, default values of zero and 15, and the weight clean we apply and um, use the same clamp number function, but this time around, minimum value remains zero, uh, uh, maximum value is now 45. So if I apply this now, I can see that I have age clean, um, new variable age clean and a new variable weight clean. And they've done exactly what we want. Um, the, the code chunk has done exactly what we wanted to do. So this basically is how the vector functions work. Uh, it takes a group, of, a group of inputs and then applies your function on it and then it gives you your, particular, your results. All right, so let's go to the data frame functions. Uh, before we look at the data frame functions, uh, I know I already talked about the data masking and we also talked about the tidy select. Uh, just to show us, uh, how do you know if a particular tidyverse function is using data masking or tidy select? If you bring up the help doc documentation of that uh, um, tidyverse function, uh, and you go through it, you will see where it is written exactly the type that it uses. So we see for select, it uses tidy select, tidy evaluation. And if we bring that of arrange up, we we'll see that arrange has data masking here. We we'll see again data masking and tidy verse in action. In, I mean, data masking and tidy select in action in a bit. Uh, but just to let you know that you really don't need to know exactly or you, need, you don't need to cram what particular type of tidy evaluation the tidyverse function uses. Uh, it's been done such that all the documentations have uh, explicit, explicitly mentioned the type of, type of tidy evaluation that is being used. Uh, some of them actually use both. For instance, if you look at filter, filter uses data masking for this particular argument, and then uses tidy select for yet another argument. Uh, enough about tidy select and data masking. Let's let's see them in action. So the first we want to do is uh, going to scenario two now. We want to be able to create specific functions that help us do um, carry out a particular task. Say for instance, we're, we're looking at our diamond data set. This is how it looks like. It has about 10 variables. And we've been asked that, can you give us the price, the average price for each of the cuts? So I want to know the average price for ideal, for premium cut, for good cut, for very good cut, and the rest of them. And then you decided to put this function together. And you call it summarize cut price. And it takes a data frame. And then you're grouping by cut because the output you want to see by cut. And then you want to be able to see what's the uh, minimum price, what's the average price, and then what's the maximum price for each of the um, diamond cuts. So let's run this function. Okay, if we look at the results, then we, we, have, a, we have a summary. 
uh, for each of the cuts, we have the minimum price, we have the average price, and then we have the maximum price. So let's say anytime you want to get the a summary of prices for cuts, you just call your summarized cut price function. But along the line, you realize that you're not just doing summarized cut price, you are also doing by depth, you're also doing um, some, you're also summarizing cut by a color by price, and you're also summarizing color by depth. So let's run each of these four functions. And then our summarized cut that gives us this for our cuts, we have main price, average price, and then the max, I mean, main depth, average depth, and then the maximum depth. And the summarized color price gives us for each of the colors, what's the minimum price, what's the average price, what's the maximum. And the fourth one also give us something similar. But if we look at the four functions that we have written up there, we'll see that the semantics are generally the same. It takes our data frame, then groups, then summarizes, we have mean, we have average, we have max. So it seems there is a lot of code repetition. What seems to be changing basically uh, is the cut sometimes, and then the price sometimes. So you've decided, okay, can I not just have a single function? Now that's uh, the next scenario. A single function that I'm able to ad adopt, uh, adapt as necessary to be able to run each of these four. So you decided to create a function and you named it summarize diamonds. So what that summarize diamond does is that it also takes your data sets and now you have decided, okay, I want to be able to group it uh, either by cut or by color as the case may be. And I want to be able to get the summary statistics either for price, for depth, for table or for any of the other variables that are contained in the diamonds data sets. So your first intuition was to say, okay, diamonds, that are your data frame, group by the value I supply to this, then summarize by whatever value I supply to the variable or the var arguments. So you expect this to work, and then you run this. And then you call your function, summarize diamonds function. Unfortunately, it gives you this error. It says must group by variables found in dot data. Column group is not found. Now you're surprised. What's, what's happening? Right. This is the challenge with the indirection I talked about earlier, uh, because, and because of the data masking that Tidyverse uses. So you, if you look at what has happened here, the first thing Tidyverse called here is our data. And what it expects is that every of the other variable you are calling are contained in your data. So what it's going to be expecting for the diamonds is that the group here is contained in our diamonds data set. But if we look at diamonds again, there is really no variable called group. So that doesn't work. Again, there is also no variable in our diamonds data sets called VAR. That won't work too because the tidy evaluation is such that this argument you call, I mean, these yeah, arguments you supply to tidy verse functions should be contained in your data set. Uh, but because that's not the case, and when you write functions, you, you, you will have scenarios like this. The tidy verse function or the tidy evaluation has a concept called embracing. So embracing is such that you tell your R function that no, the value I'm putting here is, I mean, the, the arguments I put here is not actually contained in my data sets. What I want you to look for is the value that I supply to that argument name. So if you supply cut, for, for instance, to the argument name, you are telling R that or you're telling Tidyverse that what I want you to look for in the data set is cut and not group. And then what I want you to look for for VAR is the price and not any variable called VAR. So how do you now do the embracing? 
So when you have scenarios like this, what you do is you embrace your argument name with these two curly braces. Two curly braces at the beginning and two curly braces at, at, at the end. This tells R that this group is not contained in this data, but the value I supply to group is what is contained in my data. Right, so we do the same for var here too. Sorry. We do the same for var. And this too. Right, and then we try to rerun this function. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. All right, we're good. So I call the function again, summarize diamonds. Now I'm passing cut to group. So this time around, I'm telling my function that no, you're not looking for group in my data. What you're looking for is cut. And then you're not looking for bar in my data. Instead, what you're looking for is the price. And then I run this again. And then I have this. It has given me something similar to the first result that we have that we um, had. We grouped by court and then we got the uh, price results. And then I can change my grouping and say, okay, I want to group by color. And then the uh, variable I want you to summarize with is um, Sorry, I, I actually jumped from, oops, we're actually at line 136 um, right now. So I'm going to take that again. Okay. So we're having our minimum average and then the maximum, and then this is our summarized diamonds now. So we'll run this again. And then when we check a summarized diamond, diamonds, we now see that it has actually grouped by cut and is giving us the minimum uh, price, average price and maximum price for each of the um, diamond cuts. If we write the second one, say summarize diamonds, our data is diamonds, we can change the group to color and we can change the var to table or depth, then we'll see again, it changes the grouping from cut to color. So this works, right? This works, good. But this doesn't really do all that we want it to do. Uh, for instance, what if I want to get results for, what if after I've gotten this, my results, I want to select only let's say color, the minimum and the maximum price for some reasons, I don't want the average to come out, right? R gives you the opportunity to be able to do, I mean, the tidy vast tidy evaluation gives you the opportunity to be able to uh, do a bit of customization. So we're introducing one more argument called choose. And what choose does is that it helps you to be able to select the are columns you will want in your output. So let's assume that, again, we have our data, we have done the grouping, the grouping works now, and we're summarizing minimum, we have a minimum value, we have the average, we have the maximum, and we have also introduced end that counts how many observations fall into that particular category. But we want to be able to choose what to select. Um, we don't want to just, have all the results uh, printed in, uh, on our screen. And so how do you go about selecting uh, our results? Because we, we really don't know exactly uh, what the variables uh, output will look like. Is it going to be a uh, cut or is it going to be color and the rest of them? So what we can do is we can embrace the variables we would like to see in our results. So if we embrace group, 
is going to give us whatever grouping variable we have supplied. And if we also embrace issues, it's also going to give us whatever values we have supplied to choose. So let's run this again now. And let's see the example here. So we have our diamonds. We are grouping the first one by cut. Uh, we want to see the price, but we was, want to see only the minimum, maximum. So in our output here, what we should be seeing in our result will be three columns. The first will be the grouping variable, this time around, cut, and the chosen variables, which are minimum, maximum. So let's run this. And we see we have three columns, the cut, the minimum, the maximum. Let's do a second one. Let's say we want to group by color, but we want to see just two results, our grouping column, color, and the number of observations in each of the color category. So we run this and we still have our results. So this helps us to be able to supply more than one values as, as um, to a particular argument. Uh, we, we did mean and max here, and this time around we did just n. If we like, we can do mean, max, n, or uh, something like this, and we run this, and this still gives us our result because it helps us to customize how many columns we want in our output. That's a tidy evaluation. But what if we want to be able to supply more than one values to our grouping variable? Our grouping variable, uh, like previously mentioned, uses data masking. How do you go about doing this? So what we have done here is let's attempt to run this. We have supplied two values to our grouping variable. We want to group by cut and color. We want to see at the minimum price, the average price, and then the maximum price. And then we also want to choose some columns in our results. What happens if we try this? We get an error, basically because we've tried to supply two values to the group argument. So I is telling us that cut column will be size this, not this. But does that mean that we can't supply? We know that normally if we write our function out, I mean, without having to put it in a customized function like this, you can go by more than one um, variable, All right? So how do you go? Uh, how do you go about doing that when you are writing your R function? Uh, so what you do is you attempt to. modify your function such that it allows you to be able to group by more than one variable. There are two basic ways um, you can do this using tidy evaluation. The first is you can use the across function. So if you group by across your grouping argument, this will work and you will get the results that you want. So let's try this and let's go back to running this function again. Voila, it works. So we have grouped by cut and color and we have also chosen minimum and max just as we have supplied, this works. But there is yet another way I think is generally um, recommended. So instead of using a cross function, you use the peak function. So the peak picks, just like the name, picks the grouping variable you have supplied and applies it. So let's run this now. And then let's run our output again. It gives you exactly, back exactly the same results. Uh, should you go with peak or should you go with across? Uh, at the moment, personally, I'm not entirely sure, uh, but I think probably peak is favored. I've tried a few instances and basically get the same result. So I, I think it's left for 
each of us to explore and decide, we do want to use a peak in this instance, or we do want to use a cross function. Uh, but again, th this works. Uh, what we want to do next is our last scenario. So, so far we've been having our results with minimum, maximum, and it, it's going to really be helpful sometimes when we are able to be more descriptive about what the column name is. Is it minimum price or minimum depth or minimum X, minimum, minimum what exactly? Maximum what? Uh, such that I don't need to be looking at my functions uh, to be able to say, oh, this is minimum price or maximum uh, table or something like that. So you can do that too. You can supply names. And then your names gets, um, it goes into your output as the variable name. So let's try and do a relatively simple example. So we just want to have a grouping variable. And then we want to have the average of whatever variable we supply here. So let's assume that we are grouping by cuts and we want to have average of price per cut. And we would love to supply the name instead of just saying average or something. So we are trying to do this. We have our data frame. We have embraced our grouping variable. We have also em embraced our values here. And we say, oh, okay, now it looks like embracing is what has been solving the problems for us. How about if we embrace the name? Is it really going to work? So we want to try it. We've embraced the name and we try to run this. R doesn't even allow us to run it because it's giving us an error. And it's saying that you cannot use equal sign here based on what you are written. All right, what if embracing is not the solution? I will decide, okay, let me just remove the uh, embracing and I run it again and see. Uh, whatever name I, any, any name I put here as name, you should just put it here and, and give me my results. And uh, so we try to run this again. This time around it runs. So let's execute our output. And we have supplied that we want to group by cut. We want to see uh, average price. At this time around, we don't want, we want to specifically name the output as mean price. Let's see if we get what we expect. All right, we get a result. But instead of our new column being called mean price, it's called NM. This is not exactly what we were hoping to get. So what exactly is the issue? The each challenge here is that if we want to pass arguments to the left side of the equal sign, we will have to do two things. One, you will have to embrace. Two, so let's go ahead and do the embracing first. Two, instead of using the standard equal sign, you will have to precede your equal sign with a column. I just found out recently that this particular column followed by equal sign is called the walrus operator, but I think that's for Python users. I'm not entirely sure if there is a particular name for it in R. So we try this again. Let, let me take this again. When you want to sub, uh, supply values to the left side of the equal sign operator, your equal sign should be followed, uh, preceded by a column. Right, so let's run this again. And let's see what if this gives us the results that we expect. And I think it does. Now we have our code and we're able to customize what the name of our output is. So we have it as mean price. Let's try to write a second example. Summarize diamonds. Our data set is diamonds. Let's group this time by another variable, let's call it color. And uh, let's say we want to do 
Uh, let's look at the names of uh, diamond again. So we have belt, we have table, we have X, Y, Z. All these are numbers, numeric uh, variables. Let's say we want to do table now. So uh, with a variable here will be table. And then our name, we want to call it name table. Let's see if this works. It works. So now we're able to use the same function to, I mean, make it more generic, uh, be more explicit in whatever it is we want as our grouping variable, as the variable we want to summarize by, and also explicitly mention how, what the variable name of our output should look like. I, I think this looks good. But what if you, you really don't want to be, I mean, you want to use the same value that you have supplied to buy here as the name of your new column. Take for instance, this particular, this first one here, uh, you would have wanted this to be price straight up. And this second one, you would have wanted it to be table straight up. And you don't want to be, you don't want to have this extra argument here. That is also possible. So we've taken out the NM argument in this particular code chunk. And what we have done is just come and supply this our bar to the right hand side, embraced, just like we have been doing um, before now, and supply the same value to the left hand side. This also works. As long as, don't forget, when you are uh, embracing operator on the left, I mean, embracing values on the left hand side, your equal to should be preceded by the column. So if we do this and run this, rise diamonds again, and then we execute this, what we expect is that our output should be grouped by cuts. We should have the mean, uh, uh, the um, average price. And then the column should also be called price. And that's what we have here. So if I change this and I write another one, summarize diamonds, diamonds, I can change my group to, um, let's use a different one this time around. Let's say clarity. And let's say uh, bar is Z or currents. If I run this, I have my grouping variable as clarity, and then I have my result called character. Uh, correct. So this works. Let's look at one more example. What if you want to even do more customization with the variable names? Uh, take for instance, you want to be able to see the minimum, you want to be able to see the average, you also want to be able to see the maximum. Yet at the same time, you want to be able to customize the names of the columns in your output. So we've tried to do something similar to what we did here. We are supplying the same bar here as uh, the names on the left side, left hand side of our equal to operator. But for some reasons now we're now having three bars. If we try to run this, this will run. But unfortunately, we will not be able to have the results that we expect because. And now we see we have just price. We don't even know whether it, is it the mean, mean price or the average price or the maximum price. That's basically because we have supplied three variable names. I mean, the same variable names to three different columns. And I will not allow you have cut price, price, and another price. It really doesn't help to interpret the results that you've gotten. So how do you go about customizing the names of your heart put in this kind of scenario. I think this might be look a little bit complicated, especially for those who are probably not quite familiar with our syntax. But what you can do in this instance is you can put 
additional words that are more descriptive. For instance, you can put mean here so that you have this as mean price, for instance. This one will be average, for instance, average price. And this one can be max price. So if you have it as price, you have your output as mean price, average price, max price. If you have it as a carat, you have something like mean carat, average carat, and then maximum carat. But this won't work if we try to run this. Okay? And that's basically because of something like this. To make R recognize this as, oh, this is the names we want for our outputs, we have to surround this with the um, quotations. We have to quote these names. So when we quote this, R understands that we have put a bit of description at the beginning and that the var here in our curly braces is the var we have referenced in our function arguments. So if we run this now, we have our summarized diamonds function. And when we execute this, we have exactly what we expect. We have grouped it by cut. Then we have our mean price, we have our average price, we have our maximum price. If we do the same for another, uh, if we do the same for a different grouping variable color, and then our bar here is table, we'll get the results again that we expect. It's grouping it by color. Now our outputs now have mean table, average table, max table. So basically, these are some of the examples we and um, ways in which you can use um, tidy diverse functions in your writing your own functions. Uh, it, it probably a bit complicated at first, but when you get the hang of it, you really realize that it's relatively simple. Most of what you will be doing are going to be related to embracing using the curly braces one. Two, using the what I call the walrus operator. If what you are supplying variables to the left hand side of the equal side of your equal sign, don't forget your colon. And the third is that when you want to be able to give descriptive names to your outputs, you might have to write something that looks like this. Uh, basically, if you follow those three principles, they should be able to get you by with many of the uh, functions you will be writing and they help to really to be able to automate uh, most of the analysis. Uh, and I know that for uh, people probably on this call, uh, maybe many of us have had some of the ch challenges in the past. And there are a whole lot of other ways in which you can use the tidy evaluation and the data masking and the tidy select that we've talked about to be able to further customize uh, the, your, your own function and what the results that you get. And what I'll be doing right now, uh, I'll go back to my slide deck so that uh, just point us in the direction of a few additional resources that we can find useful. Uh, I must admit that initially, uh, when I went through these re resources, they were relatively difficult. I mean, it was looking like I am not entirely sure um, if I totally get what they're saying, but. I believe that if we take time probably to maybe look through this recording again and probably ask our clarifying questions, which will really be able to help us to uh, do better with using our um, tidy bus functions yeah, in our own functions. And let's not also forget that you don't need to just only do data frame functions. We also have the vector functions that we talked about. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we didn't talk about the plot functions today because if you are plotting with ggplot2, our ggplot2 package is still part of the tidyverse set of packages. And it also basically follows the principle of the uh, data frame functions that we've talked about, except that your results uh, is not a data frame for a plot instead. Uh, the principles are exactly the same. 
Uh, so uh, that's it for me about now. Um, I don't know if we have questions from our participants. I, I'd be willing to take our questions and comments. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, uh, Tony and uh, Victor for feedback. Thanks, Joe. Um, thanks for those comments. Uh, I'm really glad that some of us found uh, this particular session to be useful. I'm hoping that I didn't really get to con confuse people, uh, or a lot of people on this call. And like, like I rightly mentioned at the beginning, please, if you need clarifications, you can again reach out to me. You can reach out to me on any of the social media platforms and you can chat me up and I'll be, able, we'll, I'll be willing to provide more context. I want to believe um, Abuja is a group as a culture of sharing uh, the resources, both the videos and the slide decks that have been used, including the, um, the scripts. And we, at our own leisure, might just be able to run through them again. And hopefully, uh, if we uh, look at them a second time or um, additional times, so we'll be able to uh, resolve any doubts or any uh, misconceptions that we might have at this moment. Uh, I don't know if you are there, Billy Kisu. Uh, at the moment, there uh, are really no questions for me. Okay, thank you so much, um, Stephen. I'm grateful. Um, I believe um, we had a really wonderful time. So please, if you have any question or comments, if you don't want to put it in the chat box, you can just signify and we'll allow you to do that using the mic. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if I can quickly take this. Joe is asking, if we cover that at any moment where you want to change the, uh, what, where you want to vary the name of the data frame that you have supplied. Uh, basic, no, we really didn't do that uh, in this particular session. Uh, but I ask, uh, what I believe is that the, what we have at this moment will help if you have a different data set. Um, as long as you are able to supply the variable. So maybe we might want to uh, take some minutes uh, to uh, uh, update the script before we finally share so that we can get to see when you supply a different data frame, as long as you have a grouping variable and then you want to have another variable that you have supplied as well. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but the principles are exactly the same thing and your code should still work. Um, I think that's it. And then Chima Alex is asking, is there a WhatsApp group for Abuja Arjusas? I believe you would want to respond to that. Yeah, okay. Um, we have a WhatsApp group, but please kindly reach out to me using the email I sent to you now. So we don't want to share it publicly because of security reasons. So just reach out to me, then I will be able to confirm our identities, then we'll share the information. So thank you. So I'll share the email as well here. So for anyone who wants to join, so kindly reach out to us to write the email or through our social media um, handles, LinkedIn, what, um, Twitter, so we'll be able to reach out to you. We don't, um, I hope you understand. Thank you so much. So do we have any other questions? Any other questions, comments? Okay, um, I think at this point, we want to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us and staying so far. We really appreciate your time and uh, we really look forward to having you the next time. And most importantly, thank you, Stephen. Um, well, one, well, we had the cool organizers, but giving your time and energy, sharing your knowledge is something very important to the community. And we really appreciate that. Thank you so much, so, so much. Thank you.
So um, at this point, I want to say a big thank you again, and we'll say a goodbye here. Um, okay. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Do have a wonderful weekend.